Hi again, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Ask the Lawyers. I'm Rob Rosenthal with AskTheLawyers.com, and today we're going to ask the lawyer about construction site accidents and specifically scaffolding accidents. And here to answer our questions is Michael Greenspan of the Greenspan and Greenspan Law Firm based in White Plains, New York. Uh, Mike, thank you for taking some time to be with us today. I appreciate it. My pleasure. So I'm guessing anytime there's uh, an area with a lot of construction, unfortunately, there's going to be construction accidents, and many of those are scaffolding accidents. So let's start with, uh, you were telling us about uh, Labor Law 240. What is that and, and why is it a thing? It's known as the Scaffold Safety Law. And what it's designed to do is protect workers whose construction work involves an elevation related risk, basically working at a height. Okay. And we found that construction work is dangerous, it's deadly, and these type of workers need the very special protections that Labor Law 240 Subdivision 1 provides. Give me some numbers. How, how dangerous, how many injuries are we talking about even just, just this year or recently? In New York City alone in 2018, 12 construction workers died on the job. This year in April, in one week alone in New York City, three construction workers died. One fell off of a roof, one was killed by falling debris, another one was killed by a counterweight to a crane. And even just a few weeks ago, someone fell off of a uh, high floor at a construction site next to Grand Central Station. So you can see this is very dangerous work and these folks require the special protection that the statute provides. Um, uh, you've handled these kind of cases in the past. You, can you give us an example or two of some of these sort of cases you've handled? Yeah, what we tend to deal with are two types of cases, workers who fall and workers who are injured by falling objects. Okay. And so many times what you have to do is to fight with the insurance companies for these buildings just to even prove that the scaffolding law statute applies, because that's where they really want to prevent uh, against a court finding in that area. So what we tend to do is to spend a lot of time building up the case and making sure we develop the facts and the law to show that this very special statute applies and why our client is subject to it. So let me give you an example. Okay. We have a construction worker who is working in a building on the sixth or seventh floor and a 40 foot pipe is being lowered and it just misses his head, but it didn't miss his hand. Oh. So we have to show that this is a worker who the statute was designed to protect. And in using a case like this, it explains what it is we're really looking for. Because in this statute, you're really asking for two questions. Was there a failure or just a lack of a safety device right. of the kind that the statute um, lists. And is that failure the reason why this accident happened? We want to focus on the why. Because if the safety device wasn't there at all, or if it failed, and that's why the worker was hurt, he's entitled to protections of that statute. And the law, what it does is it imposes absolute liability on where it belongs, the owner and the general contractor involved in the construction, and not on the worker who, in our state's highest court has explained, is hardly in a position to protect and provide for his own safety. So in this case that I talked about with the pipe, we had to find out why did this happen? Right. In this case, the pipe is being lowered, so we're talking about work, um, working at an elevation, and it was rigged properly, so it slipped, thus a safety device failure. And as a result, our clients could have been killed if he was his head was two or three inches to uh, one side, but instead was really badly hurt. Now, if someone is injured, uh, maybe that specific case or in a scaffolding accident, is this a workers' comp situation? Is it a personal injury situation? Is it both? What, what, how does that work? Well, it's it's really both. When a worker is injured on the job, workers' compensation will provide for his medical bills and certain uh, lost wages. But when the person responsible for causing the accident is not the, the uh, worker's direct employer, then there's a lawsuit involved. So what that worker is going to need is an attorney who's going to be able to advise him or her on the worker's compensation aspects of it, how to get your medical bills paid, how to get doctor's uh, visits approved or tests done or surgery if it's necessary, because that all has to be approved by the worker's compensation carrier. 
and is going to need a lawyer to go after the owner, the general contractor, the site supervisor, anybody else who is statutorily responsible for providing safety at the construction site. And it's important to note that this statute is only talking about a certain limited area of cases. So we're talking about active construction sites by people who are supposed to be there, meaning a worker. So if somebody sneaks onto a site because they want to look at a crane or watch construction going on and they get hurt, the statute doesn't help them. Ah. If someone goes on to the site at night for whatever purposes and gets injured, the statute is not going to help them. And also importantly, it specifically does not apply to the owners of one and two family houses who contract for having someone work do work on their house, assuming that those homeowners aren't the ones controlling and directing the construction, meaning telling them the methods and means in which they do the work. Now, and you said they, they would need a, uh, they would need a workers' comp attorney and a uh, litigation attorney. Generally, that, that's two different attorneys generally, correct? Yes, that is. Now, um, should say someone's injured and their and their employer says, "Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. We'll make sure you're you're you get what you need." Should they just trust that their uh, employer has their best interests in mind? No, they really shouldn't, because unfortunately, in many cases, the employer is looking about covering their own exposure right. and not really doing what's right by the employee. The employee is going to have to navigate a whole maze of laws and involving insurance companies. And what they need to do is to have people who know this area of the law, people who focus their practice on workers' compensation for that aspect of it, and people who focus their practice on trial law so that if a lawsuit has to be brought, we can make sure that the statute, if they're entitled to its protection, is applied because that's where the fight is in court. And if it is, to make sure that they get the compensation that they justly deserve. And if they try to do it on their own, it's not a fair fight. At what point in the process do they contact uh, someone like you, Mike? Is it early on? Do they wait? Uh, how do, what are the steps they should take? Somebody who's hurt should get a lawyer involved very quickly because I can assure you the owners and their insurance companies are going to be at the hospital, at the scene, as soon as they hear about it, trying to get a statement from the employee, trying to do an investigation to find out what occurred. And when someone who has just been hurt maybe is in a tremendous pain or is on medication, they're hardly in a position to be able to give a statement as to what transpired or protect their rights or avoid having their words used against them when they were not in a position to think clearly. And so should uh, they be careful? Should their family members be careful what they say to someone who's not their attorney and what kind of papers they sign, that sort of thing? Yeah, it is really important because when the investigators come down to speak with an injured worker, they're not there to help the worker. They're there for one reason, and that's to protect the owner or the contractor. That's why they're there, and it's important that the family understands this so that the worker can have representation, be careful as to what needs to be signed and what information has to be given to the owner or the operator at that time. That way their rights are protected. Great. It's great information today, Mike. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for your time. No, it's my pleasure. You'd be well. And that's going to do it for another episode of Ask the Lawyer. My guest has been attorney Michael Greenspan at the law firm Greenspan and Greenspan. Please take a second to click on the button at the bottom of the screen so you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and find out about future episodes. And if you want the best information about construction site accidents or you're ready to choose a lawyer that lawyers choose, please visit AskTheLawyers.com. I'm Rob Rosenthal for AskTheLawyers.com.